Good morning, Covenant College, or the small and faithful remnant of Covenant College, the true Covenant College, as I like to think of it. Uh, it's good to see you all. Uh, welcome to the 2022 Covenant College Res Publica Lectures. Uh, we do try to speak in Latin at every chance we get, so, uh, but Res Publica is Latin for public affairs. Uh, or public issues. Uh, it's where our English word republic uh, comes from. These lectures are made possible through a generous grant that was made years ago by an agency uh, of the PCA, the Presbyterian Church in America, called Women in the Church. Uh, they very generously gave an endowment for a set of lectures that had the task of building up the church and encouraging and equipping an informed lay leadership among men and women helping them to address serious challenges facing our world. Each year we invite a noted Christian scholar uh, to help us address serious issues facing our world. Uh, over the years we've addressed a bunch of different topics, uh, race, poverty, uh, political division, environmental stewardship, consumerism, cultural pluralism, biotechnology, sexual brokenness, a bunch of stuff. Um, this week, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Reed Shushart, who will explore the issue of digital and social media. Uh, he's Associate Professor of Communication at Wheaton College, where he has taught since 2007, specializing in the field of media ecology. Uh, before that, he was a student, uh, among the last students, of Neil Postman, widely considered to be the most influential and insightful media scholar of the 20th century. The title of these lectures is Seven Vices of the Virtual Life, uh, the History and Future of Digital Media's Spiritual Effects. Uh, in addition to these lectures in chapel, today and tomorrow, Professor Shushart uh, is offering a one credit hour class called Social Media Ethics. Some of you are signed up for that class uh, that will meet this evening tomorrow evening and Saturday morning, and know that you don't have to necessarily be registered for the class to sit in. There's some extra seats. We would welcome folks uh, to join in. Um, don't tell uh, Dr. Shushard that uh, Thursday chapels are, we never have them, and they are poorly attended. Let's give him the impression, and again, just between us, without telling him that uh, Chapel is always like this, but when the word gets out how great it is, tomorrow's chapel might be more filled, right? So <laughs> please welcome Dr. Shushart. Well, greetings. Greetings in the name of Amazon, Apple, Google, Facebook, and Microsoft. Greetings in the name of the first screen, the movie screen, the second screen, the television screen, the third screen, the PC computer, and the screen you're on now and will be ignoring me for the next 35 minutes with the smartphone. Greetings in the name of the bird flu, the swine flu, and the bat flu. They're not taking over the world, but they are going increasingly viral. Greetings in the name of TikTok, Snapchat. Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, etc. Greetings in the name of Charlie D'Amelio, who uh, the Wall Street Journal this morning reported was uh, earned $17.5 million for, what did she do? She was well known for being well known. She made $17.5 million this past year while the CEO of Starbucks, McDonald's, and Delta made $13 million. So, your need for a college education is now coming to question. If you can shake it in front of the camera. <laughs> uh, greetings in the name of Disney, Viacom, CBS, Time Warner, AT&T, Comcast, and the media corporations that control 90% of all that you see and hear and think and feel and perceive about reality. And greetings, of course, in the name of Martin Luther and John Calvin, print-bound bibliophiles who had no idea what the side effects of their chosen medium was and who understood that as law students, before they became theology students, that the law and the medium were the same. 
And finally, I think greetings are due from the I'm not feeling it, the whatever, and the I can't even. If you're numb and detached and jaded, that's a natural consequence of those media that you're imbibing, and that's where you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be bored already seven seconds into my opening my mouth. So if I can hold your attention and keep you awake, it's a startling sign that you did get enough sleep last night, which most of your generation didn't. You got 6.5 hours sleep last night. You went to bed at 3 a.m., and according to your cell phone usage, you woke up and started answering it again at 5 a.m. So you really had two hours REM sleep, and you're the most underslept generation in the world. So greetings, too, from the scratchers, the pinchers, and the cutters, from the anxious, the depressed, and the suicidal. All of these are normal consequences of the media you're ingesting. They're unintended consequences, and they're terrifying because what they indicate in the social health of our nation and our now planet is um, massively significant and will be the spiritual war that you fight the rest of your life. So, as one speaker put it recently, very boldly, he said, basically, your lives are going to suck, which isn't what you want to hear because you've been given these incredible tools. You've given, been given these incredible technologies, you've been given these incredible things that make your life bigger, better, faster, more. That make more travel opportunities, more education opportunities, more entertainment opportunities, more everything. You have lives already lived that Louis XIV could have only dreamed of. Most of you have been to more countries than Louis XIV went to. And greetings, of course, in the name of your Lord and Savior, our Son, Jesus Christ. What does he have to say about all that? What does this medium have to say about all that? When you look it up in the index, in the concordance, Twitter's not in there, right? Google's not in there. Facebook's not in there. None of the things you're dealing with are actually in Scripture. And you're like, well... There is one chapter I found... I think it's in Proverbs. It might be in Psalms. I forget. It says, Lord, prevent me from watching that which is worthless. And I thought, watching what is worthless. That's www. That's the closest you get to the Bible commenting on the Internet. <laughs> um, but other than that, there's not much. So what I want to persuade you of this morning is that media, religion, and media revolution is the same thing. I want to persuade you that every time the medium changes, the religious sensibility changes. Every time you have a media revolution, you have a simultaneous religious revolution. And I'm going to demonstrate that through scripture. Cicero debated whether the word religion was from religare or relegare, to rebind or to reread. Itself a media metaphor. When you reread the same book, it falls apart, and you have to rebind it. But when you reread the same book, it also causes the people that read it to bind themselves together into a community. So what you're reading, what you're doing, is itself the thing that's forming your character, forming your psyche, forming your soul. And so McLuhan, the great media theorist who founded the discipline of media ecology, which is the study of media as environment, he said, you know you've lost your faith when you stop praying. And he said, this happens when God switches from being a percept, something you perceive, to becoming a concept. This is often why they say that if you survive seminary with your faith intact, that's the proof that God exists. Because seminary is a great place to turn God into a concept as opposed to a percept. So what do I mean... By the way, this is the most exciting part of the talk, watching the speaker take a sip. I'll do that repeatedly, just to keep you from being bored. <clears throat> um, what does scripture mean when it says uh, that we should take all things in subjection under Christ? What does it mean to take our whole life currently now as the Bible never knew it, never understood it, never predicted it, and yet submit it to the same, what I would call, pattern recognition. So, let's start. 
Um, let's start with Noah. Noah had a religious revolution in his day. One might say he had to trade the medium of dry land for the medium of water. Okay? If you read in the story of Noah, in the story of his ark, you discover in um, Genesis 5.14, God gave him the instructions to build the ark, and he had to cover it with pitch, which is a waterproof material. 40 days, 40 nights, hundreds plus days in the thing in the water, and then the, the, the boat settles on mountains around Ararat, and they come down. And right away, the next story is the Tower of Babel. People forget that the Tower of Babel is a consequence of the Noah story. The fear of drowning is a real fear. Hey, <laughs> I don't want to die by drowning. I, I don't know how to swim. So I'm going to build a tower. And you know it's a waterproof tower because, as the scripture tells you, what's it covered with on the bottom? Close. Babel, Genesis 11.3. It's covered at the bottom with bitumen. Also a waterproofing material. You have a Bible? Okay. Um, yes, you do. You have a smartphone. I'll just Google it. Siri, how do I remember my girlfriend's name? This is Alexa. There's only one place that pitch and bitumen show up in the same place in the scripture. Anybody know where it is? There's a boy who's born, and it's really important that he's waterproof. It's really important that he not drown. It's really important that he floats. His name is? Moses. Moishi, from which we get the word Moishiach, Moshiach, the, the Messiah. And Moises, uh, Moisey, taken from the water by Miriam, his sister, Later, the same name as Miriam, Miriam, the mother of Christ, the second Moses, is significant. This is uh, Exodus 2 3, where he's saved in the bulrushes and you get pitch and bitumen. It's actually interesting. It's the inside of the boat, his little ark, bulrush basket. Uh, inside, I forget if it's inside or outside, but one is, one is covered in pitch, the other, the other side is covered in bitumen. So there's this idea in Scripture, if you read it closely, if you look for the pattern, that both man and God wanted to save this baby because the ark of Noah was God's idea for how to save yourself from drowning. The Tower of Babel was man's idea for how to save yourself from God's judgment of too much rain, right? Rain is a blessing. If it's too much of it, it's a flood. It's a curse. So you get massive significance in scripture with Moses. Now, what does Moses do? Moses leads his people out of captivity. Moses sets the pattern for all salvation other than the pattern set in uh, Adam and Eve, about which more later. Um, and Moses leads them out on dry land, right? It's very significant that he crosses the Red Sea on dry land. And he leads them almost to the promised land. And then Joshua, which you would say Yeshua, which is Jesus' name, Yeshua, which criticizes Jesus. Joshua leads them through the Jordan River on dry land, right? Replaying what Moses did. And they put 12 stones in the river or beside it. And the stones are there to this day, Scripture tells us. And that's where Jesus goes and gets baptized at Bethany beyond the Jordan. Who is Jesus? He's the waterproof man. He's the man that can actually be drowned in the water and come back to life, and that's what your baptism is. It's not about you having a mikvah bath and ritually cleansing yourself. It's, it's about that too, but it's more about you dying and then coming back to life with Christ in a foreshadowing of that. But what does Moses do when he switches? Well, let's go back to Abraham, and let's go back to the father of the three monotheisms. Abraham, according to the book of Jasher, you know this book? No, this is an apocryphal book. This is what we call the Book of Hesitations. We don't read that book. But in the Jewish tradition, Abraham smashes Terah, uh, his father's idols, and destroys them. He says, never again will I worship gods made of wood and stone, idols made by human hands. 
So the father of monotheism perceives God for the first time in a new way. These things can't be God. These are made by humans. And so he perceives God as a spirit for the first time. He sets out, right, uh, from Ur and goes west, and he is the founder of the faith. What does he do? Part of his perceptual journey is he leaves behind the physical idols and he worships a spiritual god, right? It's a media change. He changes, exchanges wood and stone for spirit. What does Moses do? When he leads his people out of Egypt, where they were slaves, what's he trading? He's trading pictures for words. He's trading hieroglyphics for an alphabet. And if you read Douglas Petrovich's book, The World's Oldest Alphabet, about which I can't say enough good things, it's a pretty recent book, pretty hard to find, and if you buy it, it's like $500, it's not, not, not that many copies were printed. But it's a serious archaeological book in the service of serious Orthodox faith. And he proves, according to his claims, that the Old Testament earliest proto-Sinitic inscriptions found in various copper mines and other places uh, between Egypt and Goshen and the Promised Land are, in fact, alphabetic early moments. If you take the current Hebrew alphabet, and you look at it carefully, and, and any, any reader of Torah can do this, you can see the 22 symbols of the Hebrew alphabet are all direct descendants from one of the 400 to 700 Egyptian hieroglyphs, i.e., the picture, pictograph of the hieroglyph morphs into the shape and semiotic form of the Hebrew alphabet. The most famous of these is the first one, the Aleph, which is an ox, an ox's head. And it's interesting because that, this is Jacques Ellul, the French media ecologist and lay theologian and Protestant provocateur. Um, he's actually a historian and sociologist and law professor of institutions. Um, wrote 58 books and not all of them have been published, uh, translated yet. So if you want a career, there it is. Uh, translate Jacques Ellul the rest of your life. You'll be very busy. <laughs> um, he says that which desacralizes a given reality becomes the new sacred. So what do Moses and his followers get wrong? Well, Moses gets it right, but his followers get it wrong. Aaron builds for them a golden ox, right? A golden bull. And so the false god made of the gold from their earrings, these are the gods that led you out of Egypt. These are the gods that protected you and served you, right? which is a practical perceptual plausibility, right? If you're going to travel several thousand miles with 1.5 million people, guess what you're going to need? Domesticated, slow-moving animals you can go chase down after they wander off at night, right? And so the actual livelihood that the cow provides under domesticated conditions, it does provide them with physical sustenance, right? You get food, you get tools, you get weapons, you get all sorts of things from a cow when you have it domesticated. So. It's a misperception, and yet the cow becomes the thing we also sacrifice on the altar of burnt offerings, and the cow gets pride of place in the Hebrew alphabet. It gets the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. God says in the Greek, I am the Alpha and the Omega. In the Hebrew, that would be I am the Aleph and the Tau. The Aleph is the ox, the Tau is the cross. If the first shall be last and the last shall be first, right? The actual symbols tell you, oh, the true God is not in the ox, the true God is in the cross. In the Old Testament, the symbolism foredates and predicts and it foreshadows that. So you see this pattern. So Moses gives his people, and Petrovich argues it's actually uh, Joseph that invents and creates the Hebrew alphabet. About that claim, keep reading, I don't know. Um, and he says, uh, you cannot, he goes up on the mountain, and God tells him, I'm the Lord your God that let you out of Israel, that led you out of Egypt, I, I delivered you, you'll have no other gods before me. First law. Second law, thou shalt make no hieroglyphic images, thou shalt make no pictographs, thou shalt make no 
analogic images in the art history sense of the word. Huh? Thou shalt make no graven images of anything. Heaven above, earth beneath, waters beneath the earth. It's a very strange injunction to include as an ethical credo unless its author assumes a connection between the forms of human communication and the quality of a culture. This is what Neil Postman wrote in his 1985 book, Amusing Ourselves to Death. This was page nine of Amusing Ourselves to Death. And this was quoted by my Presbyterian pastor at the Independent Presbyterian Church in Savannah, Georgia, Terry Johnson, one day at a sermon that my mother heard. And she said, hey, Reed was raised without a television. I'll send him this book. So be very careful. One sentence can change your life. Be very careful of what you pay attention to because it can get inside your head and ruin the rest of your life. Okay? You have to actually pay attention to what you're paying attention to. So what does that mean? And that, for Postman, was why the Bible should be taken seriously as a media ecological text. Why the Bible itself has hints and... Uh, moments of revealing of this pattern of, hey, the medium, not the content of the medium, but the medium itself actually determines a lot of how you perceive reality, and especially about how you perceive God. Um, does anybody have... Yes, you do, but let me ask you again. Um, uh, we'll get there in a second, sorry. Okay, so Moses trades... Um, the hieroglyphics for the alphabet. And think about it, like any other pictographic system, right, like uh, Mandarin Chinese or any, where there's thousands of symbols, it's actually easier to teach the young 22 symbols than 8,000, which is what you'd need to be sort of able to read a newspaper in uh, Chinese. And so it's a improvement on the technology. Right? You can actually achieve more closely a universal literacy. More women and more children can be educated with 22 symbols than with 8,000, right? It takes less time. So the efficiency of it is actually a massive improvement. We're going back there now. Um, I don't know if you're aware of it, but you're speaking Hebrew when you text. That's why you don't use any vowels. We're going back there now, which is why there were only 22 letters uh, in the Hebrew alphabet, only 700 um, hieroglyphics in the Egyptian pictographic hieroglyphic system. And yet, there are 3,600 emojis. Okay, when you use emojis, you're going back to the hieroglyphic system. Um, so, we're also going back to building pyramids. It's just they're called Amazon warehouses now. Um, and you're all just drones working for them. $15 an hour, you know, it's fine. So, uh, what happens? In, in Jewish history, you get this collection of written laws, and you're saved by the law. Now, Eric McLuhan, Marshall McLuhan's son, said that the Jews were saved, the Israelites were saved by group salvation, right? You're saved because you're one of us. You're part of Israel. So you and your household, right, you'll be saved. When literacy comes... You have private relationship with the text, you have private identity through the text, and you have private relationship with Christ. And so the New Testament is the era of literacy, and the New Testament is the era of individual salvation. Your personal relationship with your Savior, Jesus Christ, rather than a group relationship. Change the medium from orality to literacy, you change the nature of the relationship. Again, we'll talk about this in greater detail in the four-hour classes. But what happens? The law is the thing by which you are justified. By the time the Old Testament is finished, there are 613 laws. Do you all have a covenant around here? Do you find yourself breaking them accidentally, unintentionally? There's so many rules. Right? The more law there are, the more laws there are, the more law there is, the easier it is to accidentally break one of them. You're always in guilt, uh, uh, in violation of the IRS tax code law, for instance. Okay? The IRS wants to haul you in, charge you more money, and put you in jail tomorrow. They can, because they can just go through your thing with a fine tooth and go, oh, you missed this one. 
<laughs> There's so many thousands of laws with the IRS tax code. How do I, how do I keep up? You don't. You have your lawyer and your tax return expert figure it out for you and say, these are the ones you have to pay attention to because these are the ones they're hammering down on this year. Right? So you pay attention to the fashion in what's enforcing the law. So what does Jesus do? Think about what Jesus does as a medium. Jesus is the word. He's the living word, not the spoken word. Tomorrow's chapel, I'll talk about why does Jesus only write one time in Scripture, and that's what the woman caught in adultery. And I'll go into depth and detail on that. It's a very interesting, unique moment why, huh, this one time, this happens, and why. And why that story is not included in the earliest manuscripts. We'll also speculate about that. But what does Jesus mean when he says simultaneously, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself? On these two laws of the 613 hangs all the law and the prophets. So he says that out of one side of his mouth. And out of the other side of his mouth, which is actually the same mouth, he says, don't think that I've come to destroy the law. I've come to fulfill it. It's a bizarre counterintuitive claim. Like, whoa, whoa. I mean, that's a great cliff note if you're in college. Like, there are 613 laws, and you're like, I only have to know two? That's great. But how do these two represent and fulfill all those other 611. So the way Postman put it, not about Jesus, but about the general pattern of a medium, is that a medium tends to create a sort of hardening of the categories. And by that he means a hardening of the perceptual categories, okay? Which is to say how you perceive reality is filtered through the media that you are or are not engaging in. Think about how right now you're just doing it for the gram, right? Think about how right now a place is worth doing or not doing or going to or not going to because you can take a selfie there, right? So if you get the idea in your head, oh, life is about clicks. Life is about getting to be a social media influencer. Then I have to put myself in the situation where I can take cool selfies and people will click and like my stuff, right? So suddenly all of reality gets absorbed through that filter, okay? If I was Kim Kardashian speaking to you, this would be a full chapel, right? And all of you afterwards would be like, can I take a selfie with you? And she would be like, for 75000 you can. That's her speaking fee, by the way, not her selfie fee. So uh, Jesus shatters the hardening of the perceptual categories that writing produces with these 613 laws. And he liberates people to actually live in the spirit. I tell you, the time is coming, the time is now, that what the Father really seeks is people that worship him in spirit and in truth. The letter of the law, Paul says later, kills. But the spirit of the law gives life. That's a media theory. The letter of the law is writing. The spirit of the law is speech. You'll see that manifest tomorrow in the talk about the woman caught in adultery. Jesus liberates the one caught in adultery as a lawyer, as an advocate on her behalf by lifting the debate out of the text into speech. Into speech. And he does this amazing sort of jurisprudential jujitsu, if you will, and uses their strength against them to get them to create a mistrial. Judge, jury, and executioner all walk out. And so how he does that knowing, well... Under textual conditions, this is over. Under other conditions, she could go free. And why he does that, really significant. Okay, so fast forward, oh, 1,517 years to Martin Luther. He's nailing his 95 theses on the Wittenberg door in, not Lookout Mountain, but White Mountain, Germany. And it creates a firestorm. 95 complaints, 45 of which specifically mention the doctrine of indulgences. What he's really upset about without being conscious of it at the time is the mass production of a thing that is a recipe for penance, essentially. And yet, when you have it before printing press conditions, they're large, they're singular, they're expensive, and they're for groups. 
with the printing press. Now they're small, they're portable, they're affordable, and they're individually, privately available. You should get one, you should get one, you should get one. And suddenly he's very worried, sincerely worried, that the souls of his parishioners are going to be compromised because if you just think I, you need a coin to buy an indulgence, you won't take your contrition very seriously. And if you think you just buy your way out of the guilt you should be feeling, you're going to be in danger of hell. He's very concerned. So look at what happens. Thanks to the printing press and his return to source, if you will, he creates a massive religious revolution in all of Europe, from, from which you know, Europe never came back. It, 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 it evolved from there. Fast forward another 500 years to you being born into the digital age and you being born with a cell phone or a tablet or a fourth screen genetically modified into your very bones. And look at the blessing this technology has been. Are you not more sober and alert, more patient, more purposeful in your life, more altruistic and loving, more kind, more... Um, Wise, smart, intelligent, more alive, more incarnate, more really there. Are you not more feeling it? Strangely, no. Strangely, despite this incredible blessing where you used to have five friends in real life and now you have 343 on Facebook, now actually you've got the seven vices of the virtual life. And it's not your fault, but you're actually demonstrably, empirically, quantifiably, measurably now addicted, impatient, goalless, narcissistic, ignorant, desensitized, and totally disembodied. If you don't think you're addicted, think about an alcoholic. If you wake up in the morning, the first thing you need is a drink, you might have a problem. Right? If you wake up in the morning and you need to do a line of cocaine, you might have a problem. If you wake up in the morning, the first thing you do is check your phone, you might be addicted. In other words, if you don't think you're addicted, give your phone to a friend for a day, then a week, then a month, then six weeks, which is what it actually takes to quit a bad habit. And after six weeks, you don't have any more friends. And your family's wondering what happened to you, right? Like, I, I can't give you that. That's part of me. In fact, number one thing your generation says about being without their cell phone when they lose it or they break it or they can't find it is, I feel naked without it. <laughs> That's interesting. You're a member of the only species that was naked and got dressed. That's part of theological history. That's who Adam was, the naked man who got dressed. Why did he get dressed? Because he sinned, because he disobeyed the command to live by the ear, right? He was a naked vegetarian for Jesus, he and his wife. He was partially blind, not so blind he couldn't see, but so blind he couldn't see that he was naked. And the tempter says, hey, look at this, it looks good. The tempter says, hey, it'll make you wise. Hey, you'll be like God. And they eat it, and they do no good from evil. And they are suddenly able to see. And then instead of being like God, they're naked and ashamed. And so clothing and the fact of getting dressed, of being the only species that actually actually has to have, to have biological survival by virtue of an artificial secondary skin, that's the history of mediation. That's the history of media in its, in its, in its man-made sense. And the nakedness of Adam in his pre-fallen state is mirrored and replicated by the nakedness of Christ on the cross and at his resurrection. Again, about which more later. In the four-hour classes, Brock 118, don't fail to be there. It's going to be very interesting. These are things you don't get taught in Sunday school, but they're right there in the scripture. They're right there, plain as could be, to see. So what do Adam and Eve trade when they trade the truth for a lie? They trade living with God who cannot be seen, who's a spirit, to living by sight. They trade a ordered sensorium of their five senses with hearing first and then seeing and then smell, touch, and taste to a disordered sensorium where seeing is first and hearing is second and then the rest. And so, if you, Christian, have the same spirit of the age problems, i.e. the same zeitgeist, which is the unintended consequences of the media of the age, you'll be useless in this world. You'll be unable to help this world. 
But if you're aware of these issues, aware of these problems, and know how to fight them, and with what tools, and with what scriptures, then you could actually be salt and light and yeast to the world. You could actually be of use to the world. And you'll actually have something to offer the world that the world doesn't have and desperately needs, which is the opposite of those seven vices, the seven virtues of the actual life, the real life, the analog life. Um, and that's what I'm here to preach and talk and teach to you about in the next three days. And I hope you'll join in and I hope you'll ask hard questions, and I hope you'll um, tell your friends. Thanks so much. <laughs>